Welcome to True Vine Talks with Rachel and Linda. We're so glad you're joining us to listen today. Um, we're talking about engaging and connecting. And this is chapter four in the Hold Me Tight book by Dr. Sue Donkey. And engaging and connecting. So we want to, like with our couples, like when you guys would come to see us, we are, first off, we're de-escalating the negative cycle that you two have got found yourself in, which we all cycle. And we have revisited a raw spot, right? And then, well, I forgot the third one. <laughs> you combined them. Did I combine them? Yeah. Okay. We, we recognized the raw spots and revisited a rocky moment. Thank you. See, Rachel's great. So that's where we're at. And so after we, you know, calmed the tornado down, settled down, now we want to talk about what matters the most in the relationship. What is your unmet need, right? Yeah. I'm going to turn this little fan off, guys. A little loud. So this was my thought when I was first reading this book and thinking about it. Remember the movie, Jerry Maguire? Did you ever see Jerry Maguire? Cause I'm older than you, Rachel. You may not have seen no. him. Is that, I mean, you have Love Bug written up there. Yes, yes. So in that movie, Tom Cruise looks at Renee Zellweger and says, you complete me. Oh, okay. Yes, and um, that's that moment where I'm like, yeah, that's that love bug. They're, they had fallen in love and, you know, he was just, when he said, you complete me, he meant that secure attachment kind of stuff. So I thought that was a good movie about, I thought that was hogwash. You know what? When I first saw the movie, I was like, that's just a bunch of baloney. Ain't nobody going to complete you. You're going to be fine by yourself. Mm -hmm. Always believe like that growing up. You'd be better off to be alone. <laughs> you can't get hurt. Yeah. yeah. So that's when I think what's easy, and I, I, there was someone else who said, I'm in love with falling in love. I think it was Jennifer Lopez might have said that. I'm in love with falling in love. What do you think she meant by that? Like, I think. Yeah the feeling that you have, like people describe as like butterflies or. You know. Yeah. Yeah. So when you're first falling in love with someone, you feel like this rush, you know, like, oh my goodness, I can't wait to see them. Oh, they're so handsome. They're so intelligent. When you focus on all the positives, there's mm -hmm. no dreamy, right? Oh, I got a text. I hope it's from them. Oh, it is. What's this there? <laughs> yeah. Isn't it great? They're so great. <laughs> and so that is what, you know, remember Dr. Um, who was the doctor? Dr. Claude Polly. She said the dopamine is the motivating drug in the yeah. body. Yeah. She said that that helps to motivate you. Well, if you've got dopamine rushing, you feel motivated to be present with your person, your mate. Mm. And then I read norepinephrine is also being released. And what do we know about norepinephrine and epinephrine? Those are the fight or flight drugs. Yes. So you're <laughs> in high alert. It left me for a minute. I was like, I know it, but I can't think. You know it. I know you know it. So yeah, we thought, yeah, you're good. So then we've got this adrenaline pumping. We got high alert mm. and the good mood, which I think equals focus attention on your mate. Absolutely, and oxytocin. Yes. Right. Yeah. When you're in love, when Charlie and I were in love, it's like. So funny. <laughs> you know, <laughs> remember you would say, Oh, he's so smart. Although I still say that he is very intelligent. He is. 
you do say that all the time. Very, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I do say nice things about Charlie. <laughs> but, I mean, you just, everything about this person, I mean, you're attuned, you're, you're watching for them, you're thinking about them, you're dreaming about them. Yeah. You're like hanging on every word. It's great. Yeah. Can't yeah. get enough. That's like a rush, isn't it? It's just a rush. So, and Sue talks about that in this chapter, you know how the beginning stage of love, what that feels like, you know, you're, you're just madly, deeply enthralled with this person, you know, because they see you and you see them and it feels good. Oh yeah. It feels really good. So now we get to the part where we start to cycle, right? So <clears throat> one to two years, guess what happens? The rush goes away. Yeah. The drugs settle. The dopamine's not as heightened. You're familiar. You're comfortable with the person. You maybe don't say all the positive things that you said before. You're not looking for them to come home or go out with them. You're just... You settle, you start to calm down, which is not a bad thing. Yeah. But it's important. Yeah, go ahead, Rachel. You were going to say something? I was going to say the text comes through and you're like, oh, what do they want now? <laughs> oh, why do they bother me now? Mm. They just leave me alone. <laughs> yeah. So then that's when you start to see the cycle show up, I think, after that fizzles out and you become less responsive to your partner, less reachable. And sometimes life just does that. Jobs, not being with each other all the time, having kids, paying bills, responsibility. Yeah, yeah becoming less attuned to one another, right? In the beginning, like full attention on one another and now we're kind of settled into normal everyday life. We've got all these responsibilities, like you mentioned, routine. Mm -hmm. And sometimes what happens once you get into this routine, Rachel, we just get complacent. We don't reach, we don't really see that person. They're on their phone. They're not looking at us when we're talking to them. <laughs> we're like, hello, are you present? Are you here? You know, and so that's when I start to see the pursuer, you know, feeling abandoned and alone and those mm -hmm. jars like kind of gotten distant because the relationship doesn't feel as close as it once did. Yeah, so I just shake my head in the middle there. So uh, with time, we settle into the relationship. So we have to work a little harder, right? We have to work a little harder in our relationships. And so when they come and they're desperate for therapy, we're doing some things with them, aren't we, Rachel? With our couple in this stage. Yeah. Yeah, we're, we're, this is where we really start teaching them those A-R-E, our conversations, right? We want them to be emotionally accessible, responsive, and engaged with one another. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And this is where, you know, when they're in the session, it's like, what am I most afraid of? I want to ask, you know, and if you're listening, ask yourself, what am I most afraid of? by sharing with my partner anything. What was what the fear there? They won't hear you. Um, they don't care. You fear they're, they're done with you. What, what are you afraid of? Yeah. That's a hard question. Yeah, I, I think a pretty common response is, I don't want to burden them. We each have enough stress already in our lives and if I I'm sharing my fears with them. I'll be this, this huge burden 
and they'll get sick of it and they won't want to deal with it and they'll leave. Yeah, they'll get sick of it and they, they'll just want to leave me. And that touches on an attachment fear or cue. Oh my goodness. The person I love the most is going to leave me. Mm -hmm. That's scary. Yeah. So if I'm sharing with you or sharing with my spouse, hey, I, I get scared to share what I'm really feeling with you because you seem so weighed down with all this other stuff that if I told you, what I needed from you, I'm afraid I'm putting more on your plate. So sometimes you're just trying to protect the other person. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then that, that will a lot of times when someone's able to share that fear, you know, it helps understand, oh, okay, well, you're not withdrawing because you don't care about me. You care about me so much that you withdraw and shut down because you don't want to burden me. You think that it would push me away? How we're helping them understand each other's behaviors, right? And what's happening on a, that deep emotional level. Yeah, it's a deeper level than just, I'm pulling away from you because I don't like you. Right. I'm pulling away because I fear giving you any more responsibility. I fear that maybe I'm too much, or maybe I'm not lovable, you know, maybe I'm not, you know, maybe I'm not. And then and when we start to think like that, you pull away more, right? You start to think, well, I'm not lovable. How can I even share with you what I need the most? You know, why would you even want me to? So then you get that pursuer withdrawal situation yeah mm -hmm. so then we ask like when I'm working with couples what is your unmet need from him or her right yeah what is your unmet need it's a hard question yeah they just look at you like unmet need yeah most people have never thought about it. They've no, definitely I, never been asked. No, no one's asked. How many people, when you've been somewhere, say you went to a get together, did someone ever look at you, Rachel, and say, What's your unmet need, Rachel? <laughs> Not one. <laughs> yeah. What, what, what is your longest desire? What do you need the most? <laughs> Mm -hmm. That's a good question in of itself, isn't it? Well, what is your unmet need, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And then explaining, you know, an unmet need would be, you know, what is it that you need from your partner to feel love, belonging, acceptance, and connection, right? Do you need a hug? Do you need words of affirmation? Do you need them to verbally tell you you're the only one I want to be with and you matter? Very good. Yes. So you, you, you put it so nicely, Rachel, is as far as like the attachment stuff goes, do you need a hug? Do you need words of affirmation? What do you need to hear from them to make you feel wanted, desired, and loved, and cared for. Yeah. For some people, it's a it's a, a good morning. Okay. I need to know that you care that I'm still alive today. <laughs> that you didn't die last night, you know? I mean, you didn't know that you acknowledge I exist. I know that sounds very surface, but hey, if you're if you've been in this pursuer withdrawal so long, you may not even be saying hello or good morning. And what what harm is it in looking at the person you care about the most and just saying good morning to you? No harm at all. 
And how does that feel to hear good morning to you? Feels great. Right? Yeah. You're acknowledged. I matter. There it is. I matter. Mm. Language is everything. And that's what I teach the couples I work with. Rachel and I, we're, we're teaching a new language. And that's what my awesome supervisor, Shelly Coleman, she taught me that. It's like, this is a new language. People doesn't feel familiar. It feels awkward and mushy. Like, oh, that doesn't seem real. People go, that doesn't seem inauthentic to say, I long for you. Really, though? Don't you long for your spouse to be close to you? Isn't that true, though? And if it's true, how come we don't use the language? Yeah, I, I think it's because we don't see it modeled for us in the real world. We don't we, see it modeled for us in movies and TV shows very often. Hmm. People don't sing about it in songs. We have these unhealthy ideas, right, on either side of the spectrum, either this like sweep you off your feet romance that never ends and needs no work and it's completely easy and natural or just, you know, chaos and misery and doom. Yeah. It's like sweep you off your feet, that's first six months to two years, or it's just chaos and doom and you're never... There's always an obstacle to, to getting to your person. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Some obstacle there. And tag yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that, you know and, well, in our case, the antagonist is the cycle, isn't it? Yeah. The antagonist in relationship is the cycle that happens between because the two of you are not able to create a secure attachment because the cycle got in the way. Right. Assuming that when I, you know, storm out of the room and, and get upset that my partner is going to know that that means I'm asking for reassurance and I need to know that I matter to them. <laughs> In reality, they're just going to think, what's she upset about now for? What, a, you know? She's so dramatic. <laughs> 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 so this like you know conversation for hold me tight is all about couples learning to be real with one another to be honest and be vulnerable and, and that's the only way that we're going to reach you know this deep connection and intimacy is by laying it all out on the table right in this moment, I'm afraid that I'm not enough for you and I need reassurance that I'm the only person you want to be with. Yeah. And it's not someone else. It's not an image you're looking at that you'd rather be with. It's me. You want to be number one for your spouse. I don't care what anyone says. Of course you do. Yeah. Yeah. People say, oh, no, you don't have to be number one. <laughs> yeah, you do. Or you would be protesting. And when I say protesting, that means like stormy or, you know, yelling or saying a few cuss words when you're mad. I mean, that's, I'm, that means I'm not happy in this relationship. Yeah. I need you to hold me tight and reach for me. And tell me I'm the only one for you. Absolutely. And I'm not going anywhere. Right? It does matter. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, in conversation four, um, of course, let me just say this too, Rachel, is that we've already slowed down the cycle. So it is safe in the yes. relationship. And when we say safe, we mean we're not talking about abuse. We just mean it's safe to share being vulnerable. That person isn't going to cut you with your vulnerability. You are in a good space to talk about your unmet needs. You know, we ain't saying we're getting ready to get a divorce and then talk about <laughs> what we need. Right. To 
Yeah. Divorce, separation, moving out, it, it has been taken entirely off the table. Yes. We're no longer dismissive of each other's emotions, right? No one's, no one's expressing that they're feeling unimportant and then the other person's, well, don't feel that way. Like, we've learned to be empathetic and listen. Yeah. Yeah. And I've That's messed up. Bring up. I've messed up in couples therapy going too soon for that when I first started. Oh, yeah. I think we all have. Yeah. yeah. And then you feel terrible. You're like, ooh. Then you're over there trying to soothe the person. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It wasn't safe to share. What was that like for you? It wasn't safe to share yet. You know, because you know, that's all you need is to be slapped in the face for being vulnerable and real. Eek. So definitely want to know that you're not going to be attacked and reactive in the bond reaction, you know, the fight and flight stuff if you're sharing those deeper longings and unmet needs i'm not going to tell you rachel that i fear rejection if you if you don't already accept me right yeah. you are accepting why me. would you yeah yeah yep so yeah go ahead oh i was just gonna i think reiterate what you were saying like you, you absolutely don't want to be you know talking to a wall so to speak, when you're sharing your deepest fears and longings, right, that you've probably never even said out loud to yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're not sharing your deep stuff if that person's not fully present in that space with you, looking you in your eyes and sharing with you and you're there to hold them tight when they say, I fear you'll reject me. Very much so. Yeah, you don't want to stone someone over there stonewalling. <laughs> you're talking yeah. to a stone, well, I'm really feeling vulnerable right now and I feel scared that you don't care. They don't care. <laughs> they got their head yeah. they don't care. Yeah. So they're like, oh. yeah. Not good. Because then that, that validates the wrong thing right that validates oh I need to have this fear because clearly they don't care I'm sharing this and I'm, I'm getting no response yeah it doesn't even feel like they're listening yeah it doesn't even feel like they're listening and isn't it Brene Brown you've got to earn the right to know my my vulnerability yes how she says it yeah I, I think that's in her one of her books yeah mm -hmm. yeah Cause I, yeah, she's talking about her daughter. Don't share everything. They've got a trust jar. <laughs> yeah, like little little pieces over time. Build it up. Yeah. Little pieces. So if your spouse typically shows up for you when they say they're going to come, they call when they say they're going to call, they listen when you tell them you need them to listen, you're probably getting in a, you're in a safe zone with that person. But if they're still ignoring you, not answering your text, don't be sharing. <laughs> it's not, it's not yeah. going to do it. You're just going to get more hurt. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <sighs> yes. Conversation for engaging and connecting on a more um, real, softer space. Those, those longings, unmet needs, and desires. It's a tough session. Yes. This is the, I mean, the core. Of the, of the relationship. Mm -hmm. This is what creates that openness, you know, between the two of you and creates a secure, safe place. So when, you know, you look at me like that, if you look at me like that, and I, that's my raw spot, and then I get mad and angry with you, I don't, I need you to come over and say, I love you, I care about you. You know, I need you to say that to me. I didn't mean to give you a look. Oh, okay. So I feel comfortable and safe saying, oh, okay. Yeah, I did get fearful that you were mad at me and you were rejecting me. And that takes me to a dark place. No. 
that creates mm. those moments. Yes. And when you have a moment like that with your partner and you're both making eye contact and you're attuned with one another, you're engaged, right? You're, you're receiving empathy when you're sharing these deep, vulnerable fears, right? That gets our, our mirror neuron going, right? Mm -hmm. When we look at someone and, and we, and we kind of take in the emotion that they're sharing with us, the, the other person that's observing starts to feel that emotion too. Right? And that this is the real power of magic of emotionally focused therapy. Because, you know, we can talk logic and reasoning all day long, right? And, you know, you might change based on logic and reasoning. But if I can, if I can get two people to look one another in the eye and move one another emotionally, that is going to create like long-term lasting change. Yes, Rachel, you said that so well. If you get two people to connect and they're looking eye to eye to each other and those mirror neurons are firing off, that's creating that safe connection. And what mm -hmm. you said was so true, that creates long, sorry, my eyes watering, but that creates that long lasting bond. You aren't looking over there for someone else to meet your needs because guess what? You need to be in med. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Good. We're both gonna experience, you know, that a, a physiological reaction at the end of that. It feels really good. I feel connected. I feel close to you. I feel like you get me, you see me, all of me, and you accept it. Oh, that feels good. That feels so good. And you know, when she talks about the baby, I think she talks about it in there, but when I would hold Grant and I would look in his blue eyes and he and I, when he's a baby, and I held him so close, there was that mirror neuron connection, oxytocin one. We have a secure bond. So easy with your baby though. So easy. <laughs> it is. And that can happen between you and your spouse. You can have that kind of interaction like you're describing good good yeah and then you know sue talks about in the book when she witnesses two people having this moment she herself gets you know full of joy right i love it when my couples connect i i cry with them man i'm just like yeah. overjoyed isn't it overjoyment that you feel? Yeah. 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 So rewarding. Yeah. When two people were fighting and then they start connecting, you're just like, wow. <laughs> yeah. this is we're so like, cool. yes, this. This is what we want. Yeah. yeah. I wish I could have done that for my parents as a kid. <laughs> that was an EFT counselor. <laughs> yeah. Sitting over there, all right, mom, how are you cycling? Dad, what did you do? <laughs> like, imagine doing that as a kid with your parents. <laughs> oh, God. Awesome. I know. But we, we appreciate you guys, uh, you know, listening to us and supporting True Vine through the pandemic. We know this has been a hard time for all of you. Um, and we just, you know, we want you to know that we want to be there for you. And if you would happen to have a negative cycle or you want, you know, you have a troubled teen, I know a very good counselor sitting here named Rachel, really great with teenagers too. Um, we do love teens and kids. We aren't seeing, um, I think it's, we're seeing from 11 and up. Is that right, Rachel? Is it 11 or 12 and up? Um, I think it's like 10. Okay. 10 yeah. and up, 10 or 11. Because below that age, we they they can't focus on the Zoom and we can't do the really good therapy. You got to get in the floor and play mostly with kids. So, so we appreciate you listening to Conversation Four, and we hope that you guys are gaining something from our podcast. There are many podcasts out there. You can look them up with EFT. It's good stuff. So, 
Thank you for joining us today. Bye. Bye.